Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, the book of Nehemiah is a book of, uh, of redemption, but it's also a book of second chance. And I don't know about you, but God has given me second chances. God has been filled, uh, has filled my life with so much grace and so much mercy. But you never, you can never allow God's grace to be your ticket to keep doing what you want to keep doing. At some point, something needs to change. At some point, there has to be some personal conviction of, of maybe some of the things that God has brought you out from and, uh, and you want to stay out from those places. And uh, I don't know if there's maybe someone here that has either lost some things or maybe you've lost yourself, okay? It doesn't matter how righteous you are. Even the righteous people fall. And so, or you've maybe someone that didn't just lose yourself. Maybe you're, you're someone that lost everything. And I love the book of Nehemiah because this is a story of redemption. This is a story of rebuilding a place that's broken. Obviously, as we read last week, we were, we were you know, getting just the foundation of, well, what was it that Nehemiah was doing? What was it that he saw? And I really believe that God wants to show you something in the next few weeks as we stay in this theme of rebuilding the walls. We know that he looked at the walls of, of Jerusalem, uh, and, and he just began to have this burden and, and, and mind you, this wasn't new information to him. He already knew that the walls were burnt down and the gates were broke. He knew that all this stuff had happened. But, but there, was, there was a moment of revelation, and I pray that that revelation happens to many of you today. That today is your moment where you, you, that God reveals something to you that you haven't seen before. And so uh, God touches the heart of Nehemiah as the people come and they begin to share all of the, the, the broken stories that, that they were sharing with him about the people who lost their life, who lost their homes, who lost everything. And, uh, and then now Nehemiah has this burden. Now, mind you, the people of Israel were trying to build, rebuild the walls for 70 years with no effect. Have you ever tried to build your life? For years and years, and with no effect, you have no progress. Then Nehemiah comes into the picture with God. And what they could not do, what Israel could not do in 70 years, God anointed, appointed a man by the name of Nehemiah, and he did it in 52 days. So just think about this. What you can do in your timeline, God can do in days. And, and, and listen, I know that many of you, when you read the scriptures, you're thinking, oh, what's the big deal? You built a wall, man. <laughs> no, no. I've been to Israel. I've seen the walls of Jerusalem. And let me tell you something. You, you would be stunned. I mean, I saw bricks, literally. I don't know if they're bricks, but it's, it's like really amazing rocks. The size of this, this, this table here. And I'm thinking, okay, we have equipment today to live something like this. These were men. How did they build the wall? Let me show you some walls of, of, of Jerusalem. Look at this. Okay. Do you see that little person at the bottom left-hand corner? That's how big the walls are. That's what they were rebuilding. You know, they weren't rebuilt. They weren't taking little bricks that everybody was like, okay, let's all carry bricks, you know. It, it wasn't like that. Look at this next picture. Remember when I said that when Nehemiah saw the devastation, the, the broken walls, it wasn't just that he wept for the people that had lost everything. Nehemiah also had the conviction of his past generation. He saw his ancestors, the men and women of God who were the originators who built that wall, who are now in that same place. That's a graveyard, which is pretty eerie when you go there. It's like, wow, this is, it's amazing, but it's eerie as well. That these were people that were former believers that were willing to build something for God. And then the next picture, you see there's the temple. You see the temple way in the back? Okay, that was the place of worship that was also in ruins. And I told you last week that that temple right there that you see there, if we were to put a value, a real estate value on that temple today, that would be worth $1 billion. That's the value that God placed on your life. God, God you're, you're beyond $1 billion. You have beyond anything that you could ever, I mean, you're worth 
God giving his son in order to save you from yourself. And, and so as we started talking about um, the story of Nehemiah, you guys can take that down now. I, I started thinking to myself, I wonder uh, how many of us actually realize that we are no different like the times of Nehemiah. I wonder how many of us realize that we're no different than those broken walls in the church. There are so many broken walls in the church. And when I, when I say broken walls, I mean you, me. And it's not easy to accept the fact. I mean, no one wants to be called broke. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to be vulnerable in today's uh, uh, society. No, nobody wants to be real. As a matter of fact, it is so difficult to find real people nowadays, even in church. We've got too many facades in church. We've got too many praise the Lord, sister, praise the Lord, brother, people in the church. But there's no, there's no, there's no authenticity there's no transparency. There's no honesty. And when you're not honest and when you're not transparent, let me tell you something. You're a disservice not only to yourself, but you're a disservice to people. Because then they think that, you know what, holy thou art, there is no way that I could ever go to that place called Elevate. Let me tell you something. Elevate Church is the perfect place for people that are so busted and broken. It's the perfect place. It's the place for jacked up people. I'm talking about you. <laughs> Look at your and be like, you're jacked up. <laughs> let, let, let me be honest with you. Listen, if you, don't think, if you don't think there's something wrong with you, why don't you ask your spouse? <laughs> if, if you don't think that something's wrong with you, why don't you ask your child? Oh, because your child won't lie. Your child will tell you what kind of father you are and what kind of mother you are. Uh, child, you, you're like, okay, let's talk about you. Child, <laughs> if you want to know how broken you are, ask your mom. Ask your daddy how jacked up you are. So we're talking about everybody here. We're broken people. And we have to come to the place that we have to understand that, that the reason that the walls of Jerusalem were broken was not because there was just an enemy. We also have to remember that in this time, the Jewish people themselves, okay, turned away from God. They turned away from God's plan. They turned away from God's purpose. And when you turn away from God's divine design for your life, you know what happens? You become the person that gets trumped and you get destroyed and then you become the person that's vulnerable and they are plundered and then we start blaming God for it all. The people right here of Jerusalem had turned away from God that even Nehemiah, you know what? He allowed what he was seeing. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, that for three days, when he went to go check out the walls, the broken walls, for three days he just walked and it says that he looked at the condition of the walls and he did not like what he saw. So many times we don't want to accept the fact that you and I have issues and therefore we ignore the fact that we have some, some, some flaws in our life. That's like ladies, especially you, you know more about this than, than men do, but you know what, if you get a pimple in your face, you know you just become like this expert on, you know, makeup. And you're just trying to cover that puppy up because you don't want anybody to know that you got a pimple, right, or a scar or whatever. And so you'll spend some time on that thing to cover it up. But the reality is this, is that sometimes we work so hard at covering things up, but the reality is that the pimple is still there. And so as Nehemiah was looking at the walls, he was realizing that not only was there an issue with, with Israel who had drawn away from God, but he started realizing that, you know what? It prophesied to him. It spoke to him. And he started thinking about him, his own life and his family. He said, you know what, God? I repent. I repent for the people of Israel. For we have walked away from you. We have done our own thing. We have, we have built our own altars, our own ideologies, our own theologies, whatever you want to call it. And, and even he had drawn away from God that he had this conviction as he saw brokenness that he began even to repent for him and his family. And he said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive my wife. Forgive my kids. We're all cray-cray. And he's like, God, please. You see, once you come to that place of reality, 
that every single one of us have maybe a issue or some issues and we begin to be honest with ourselves and come back to the truth we'll never see healing because the reality is this is that when you look at the broken walls of today's society you can literally see that you have broken families you have broken marriages you have broken parents you have broken children we have broken callings huh we have we have broken morality we have broken all kinds of everything there's broken everywhere but until the church takes responsibility and says, my God, man, I live in this broken world. I wonder where my broken is. And being honest with yourself and being truthful. Let me give you a truth point right here. Look it up on the screen. Truth. It won't get fixed unless you know it's broken. It won't get fixed unless you know it's broken. And I think that so many people never come to the place of wholeness because they won't admit that it's broken. I know that sometimes, you know, as faith people, we can be so, so into faith that we forget that God has a process. You know, sometimes we just want a faith forward, and I get faith forward. Okay, I'm a, I'm a big faith guy. I love faith, man. Speak to the mountain. Spit at the mountain. Whatever you want to do. Uh, but, but, but here's the deal. But there's still a process. And I think we want to skip the process and we'd rather just put a, t a tape on it. We want to just put some makeup on it. Now God's saying, no, l listen, th those days are over. I'm building me a, a, a remnant church, a, a, a church that, that, that is going to come to a place of authenticity because that's where the Spirit of God is going to show up and do great miracles. Amen? And so as, as Nehemiah is inspecting this for three days, you know, he realizes his brokenness. But have you noticed that rarely, ever say rarely, rarely do you hear a person say or ask God, break me, God. I mean, I've heard the religious services where people start like, yeah, just break me until he breaks you. <laughs> and then you're mad at God, like, why did you break me? It's like, you know, break my heart for what breaks yours. Have you ever prayed that prayer? And then he breaks you. And you're just mad and you're angry. And, and, and then we get so discontent and we're so unhappy. And so not only is that rare, but rarely do I ever hear a man or a woman thank God for their brokenness. Have you ever thanked God for, for the brokenness of your life? Have you ever said, you know what, some of you, you're in a broken place. I mean, what if, what if we were to just say, God, I, and I'll explain it in a little bit, so don't think yet you have a crazy pastor here. Uh, but like, God, I, I just, like, that's rare. That's even more rare that a person would say, God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for this brokenness of my jacked up life. Like, thank you so much that you have allowed me to go through this brokenness. <coughs> have you ever prayed that? It's quiet up in this Pentecostal church. <laughs> Why is that? You know what? I have come to learn in the 21 years of walking with God. Uh, I, I, I've learned that, uh, that God can do more with someone's brokenness than he can do with someone's gifts and talents. I, 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 21 years. You know what? I have found that through my brokenness of, of sickness, through my brokenness of family, through my brokenness of relationships, God has been able to do more with my life than the gift I have to teach, preach, lead. He's done more. You know why? Because my brokenness became my story. And my story is what has become people's salvation. So God can do more with a broken person than he can with a person that's just so gifted and talented that you've arrived. And, and we have to get that revelation. And so let me just give you a point real quick right here. Look up on the screen. Blessings are found in the breaking. Say that with me. Blessings are found in the breaking. Stay with me. Do you guys remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? Okay, so there was 5,000 men, right? Anybody like bolillos? So good. So, so how, many, how many loaves did Jesus have in that story? Five loaves. How many fish? 
two fish. Okay, good. So Jesus has five loaves, two fish, and he has an audience of 5,000 men, not including women, children. Experts say that it's, it was probably about twelve to 14,000 people there. Okay, that was with women and children. And so Jesus, check this out. So Jesus is seeing the need. And, and in this audience, it wasn't a bunch of believers. It was a mixture of sinners, broken people, busted people, uh, people that were prostitutes, people that were liars, people that were thieves. I mean, it wasn't just an audience of a bunch of church people. It was it was. A broken group of people. And so Jesus, he, he begins to see their need. And, and the Bible says that he had compassion for them because they had followed him for days. Do you know that when you follow Jesus, he shows compassion towards you? And, and he had so much compassion that he sees the brokenness of the people and he weeps for them. And then, of course, we know the story. I'm not going to preach on that. But he, he grabs the, the, the five loaves, the two fish, and he picks up a loaf. And it's pretty awesome because... You know what? This loaf represents you and me. And it's like, you know what? God has compassion for me. Oh, Mauricio. You know, I love you. Right? And then he says, he, God, Jesus starts thanking God the Father for Mauricio. Father, I thank you for my son Mauricio. I thank you for this blessed man. I thank you, Father, for for blessing his life. I thank you for blessing his call. I thank you for blessing his family. Father, I thank you for blessing his children. Oh, Father, thank you so much for blessing me with this son of yours who has a divine purpose, who was predestined before the foundations of the earth. And he just says, Father, bless him. And he does this. What the? It's amazing how many of us don't realize that, yes, the compassion of Jesus brought you to him. He compelled you to come. And so you come in, you get saved, right? And you start maturing and developing in your walk with God, right? But let me tell you something. There comes a point in your walk with God that he is going to break you. See, grace kept you there until something happened and then you were broken. But God knows exactly when to break you. He knows exactly the hour, the day, the date of when he needs to break you. Grace kept you until Jesus said, okay, grace is up. Boom. Blessings are found in the breaking. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so if you're not, if you're not, if you're not mature... You can be the immature Christian forever and ever and ever, and nothing's changing. You're, you're, you're still not generous. You're still not forgiving. You're still not kind. You're, you're, you're still not serving. You're, you're not willing to, to sacrifice. And, and so at some point, you got to come to the place where God can say, okay, you know what, Mauricio's ready. Man, you don't want to be the person that is on your deathbed. Now you're just begging for salvation. God wants to do something. He blessed it, but then he broke it. The miracle begins in the breaking. That's where it begins. And I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you're broken. Maybe something happened in your family. Maybe something happened in your personal. Maybe something happened when, when you were a child. And, and you know what? Then, then you came to Christ, and then you felt better. But guess what? But God wants to address that issue. God wants to heal that place. God wants to redeem that place. God wants to rebuild that person that you lost in the midst of that pain. God wants to address it. God wants to deal with it. You see, God had to allow Nehemiah to go see the brokenness so that it would prophesy to his broken issues. It wasn't just go build me something. It's go build me something. And while you're building that, guess what? You got a little something, something in you too. We just went from Pentecostal to Catholic Church. That's okay. That's all right. I'm good. I'm good with that. That's good. Say with me, the miracle begins at the breaking point. When he said, boom, bless, that was the breaking point where he said, blessed. Aren't you glad you came to church today? 
So in your mind, you're thinking, he's killing me. No, he's blessing you. Do you think God's going to let something kill you? He won't do that. <laughs> he wants to rebuild. So um, obviously in Nehemiah, uh, the people, they, they, they hear Nehemiah. They say, okay, we're ready for this restoration. We're ready for the rebuilding. But the moment you say, I'm ready, get ready. <laughs> because the moment, have you, ever, have you ever heard someone say this? Man, since I started coming to this church, I mean, I, before coming here, I was fine. I had a job. I had everything was going. Then I started coming here. Man, I lost my job. I, my car broke down. I, and you think you're cursed. No, you're blessed. <laughs> it, it's, that, it's, it's just that you have an enemy. Anytime you try to change in your, in your life, you're always going to have a heckler come in. The haters are going to hate when you're turning your life around. Let me show you Nehemiah chapter 4 quickly, verse 1 and 2. Look at this. So now they're ready to start rebuilding the wall, and, and, and they're all in agreement, and they're all ready for change, and, and they've been broken to be blessed and all that noise. And it says, and Sanballat heard that, here Sanballat was the, was, the, was the enemy. He was the one that destroyed the walls to begin with, and, and Tobias. And it says, and they heard that we were building the wall, and they heard that we were building. You know that Satan, he hears when you're ready to change. He, he can hear that. Like when you say, okay, God, I'm ready for change. He's also there hearing. You know why? Because he's nosy. He wants to know what God's doing in your life. He shows up like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what are you doing all these here? What, what do you mean? What do you mean? He's going he's gonna to pastor. What? And so look. And so, so he became very what? Angry and upset. That sounds like the spirit of saying. Anger. Upset. And he made fun of the Jews. And he spoke to his friends and the army of Samaria. So, so here we have this heckler. He's bringing up some more hecklers. Like, <laughs> check this dude out. Look what he's going to do. And so it says, and he said, what are those Jews trying to do? Look at this. Can they make their city wall like new again? Will they offer sacrifices? In other words, are they, do they think they're going to start going to church now and really start to change? Like, dude, I know your past. What do you mean you're a churchgoer? Girl, I know where you were last week. Don't even start pretending. The moment you take God serious, God takes you serious. And, and so it says, can, can, can they make their city wall like new again? Think about, it's talking about you and me. It's talking about the soul. It's talking about you. It's talking about rebuilding you. Will they offer sacrifices? Can they finish everything in a single day? Those stones from their city wall and buildings are piled up like trash. Have you ever felt like trash? Huh? I think that's where we all come from. Sin is trash. We all come from a pile of it. We all come from a pile of trash. Every single one of you, including me, we all come from trash. Every, like it or not, man, if you want to get religious, like, no, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm, be quiet. No, see, facade. See, because God can do something beautiful with trash. And so he's like, do these, do these fools think they're going to build something out of trash? And, and listen, what... What God values, people will devalue. And, and, and they say, um, <laughs> and everything has been badly burned. Can they use those stones to rebuild everything again? <sighs> Can he use those stones to rebuild everything again? Let me tell you something. You and I know people right now that don't deserve grace, that don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve any form of forgiveness, but neither did you. But God, with his unfailing love, with his agape love, his unconditional love, he looks at you and I, and he says, I can do something with trash. As a matter of fact, God loves a pile of trash. He loves it. He thrives on trash. He thrives in the area of brokenness. And you know what? It's interesting because um, 
this, this story brings me back to yesterday. I was teaching our, our missionaries how to share your, your testimony in two minutes. And so I had to give them a, 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 almost like an outline, like, okay, the first thing you got to do this, this, this. And so anyways, they, 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 they got it. And I said, okay, test time. Let's go ahead and start giving your stories. And so I started hearing the stories. I'm like, wow, amazing testimonies. But one of them was, um, was Verlin. And Verilyn um, is, is this precious woman who comes to our church. She's on our mission team. And she started sharing her story, and she starts, she, she grew up in Nigeria. And, uh, and, 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 and her mom, at the age of nine, died suddenly. Okay, so I'm here, and I'm already, I'm like, in the end, I'm like, oh, my God, I had no idea. And, and so she comes from Nigeria, uh, obviously, you know, there's poverty, et, et cetera. And, and then she says, and then she, 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 she was taken in by a family, a brother-in-law and, 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 and his wife. And, 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 of course, she starts growing up. And so now she's already hurt to begin with. Her mother died at the age of nine. So she already had anger issues with God. And, and she kept living. And, and as, she was, as she was growing up, she had to start working on the streets selling uh, 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 items in order to, to bring back and help provide for her family. And, and then, you know, later on, uh, I mean, here now, her mother dies, someone comes in, a person steps in and begins to take that, that, that family figure, that mother figure, and then that person dies. And so now she's really mad. She's really angry. So you look at the story, you look at the theme of her life, it's brokenness after brokenness. And you could only imagine the abandonment issues maybe she had to deal with, the trust issues she had to deal with. I, I even think even accepting anybody's love, right? Because when you've lost people, I'm sure it's hard to love anyone or even allow anyone to come in because God may strike them. And so what was amazing was as she was telling her story, I was like, wow, man, that's powerful. Good Lord. That's some broken story. That's some trash. And, and she says, and, and she's like, I was so angry at God. And, and, but, but then there was a person who invited me to church, and I didn't want to go to church, but I went to church with this person. And she says, I walked into the church. And, of course, she's angry at God. But as the message was going forward, it was the message of, you know what, people that are angry with God. Why? And so he literally just read her. Aren't you glad that God knows exactly what you need, when you need it? And that was the day that she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And you know what? Once she got that, she started having this, this entrepreneurial spirit of, you know what, I'm going to achieve. And she became hungry. And, and, and all of a sudden, she went from, from just being angry at God and praying Nehemiah's prayer. Do you know what Nehemiah prayed? He said, you know what, Lord, we're praying to the God of heaven, the God who gives us success. And if you look at, at her today, she's been restored, redeemed, transformed. And today she is an attorney, a successful attorney. Listen, God will take trash. He will take your ashes and give you beauty. But just know this, the moment you start steering the, the right direction is when the, the haters, the enemy comes and he begins to, to talk and to tell you, are you serious? Come on. How many times have you done that? You're, you're lying. You're playing God. But we serve an awesome God, don't we? We serve a redeeming God, a rebuilding God, a restoring God. So here's the deal. Point number two, look at this. He feeds the multitude with your broken pieces. He feeds the multitude with your broken pieces. That's where I'm saying, that's where you say, God, I thank you for my brokenness. Because I don't know about you, but the people that have impacted me most are not the people with information. The people that have impacted me the most are the people with stories of their own experience. You see, I've had cancer. I've been there, done that. When I meet people that have cancer, do you think they receive from me a little bit more than the person that's never experienced cancer? Oh, yeah, they do. You know why? Because now I'm feeding them from a place of brokenness. That's why you thank God. I never say, God, why did you allow that? I always say, God, thank you for the cancer. Did he give it to me? No. But God will take what the enemy meant for bad. He'll take the trash the enemy tried to bring on you, and he'll use it for you to feed multitudes like the fishes and the loaves. And that's the God that we serve. Amen? Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
the God of heaven will give us success. That's what, that's what Nehemiah prayed. That's what he prayed. And so after uh, these people were, were being, you know, haggled by all these people, look at what they said in, in Nehemiah 4, 6. He says, so we rebuilt the wall. At some point, you got you to gotta just accept the fact that people are going to get weird with you. But you got to have a so we in your spirit. Yeah, I heard you. So you know what we did? We rebuilt the wall. You know? So this is what we did. We rebuilt. We restored. We redeemed. We did this. And it says, and we repaired it until all of it was half as high as we wanted it to be. Come on, that'll put a little salt on the devil's womb when you're willing to take all the trash and you say, you know what, man, we're going to rebuild it just a little bit bigger. I'm going to go just a little bit further. Yeah, you know what? Maybe my walk with God wasn't as strong then, but, man, it's going to be stronger right now. And maybe you're already stronger right now. Say, I'm going to be stronger -er -er." (laughs) But whatever it takes. So we rebuilt the wall. We repaired it until all of it was half as high as you wanted it to be. You determine how high you want to go. You determine. Sometimes we can reach a level in our life, whether it's spiritually, financially, relationally, come on, even, even, even in business, where you can become so weary because of all the stuff that's happened, that here, God wants you up here, but you're satisfied with down here. Some of you are right here, but you're satisfied with here. Some of you are here, and you're still satisfied with here. God's saying, hey, listen, when I rebuild... I, I put a spirit of champion in you. Uh, I, put, I put a spirit of, of build inside of you. And you can build it as, as high as you want. But sometimes we let the stuff that, that happens, the brokenness that comes into our life, keeps us from building anymore. God's saying, no, it's time to rebuild. It's time to go higher. It's time to go stronger. And it says, and the people worked with all their heart. If you're, if you're waiting for one of these, Father, change them. <laughs> we're waiting a long time. Yeah, I pray this, Father, touch them. I'll get to work. Do what you got to do. Make the changes you need to make. Get the people you need to get in your circle. Take the people you need to get out of your circle. Connect with some people with wisdom. Get some people with some revelation. Go hook up with people with transformation. Go sit with someone that's already where you want to be, where you want to go. You have to do your part. You don't just sit there and be like, okay, God, just change me, Father. Just change. That doesn't work. That's a starting point. But there you got, it says, and the people, they worked with all their heart. And the people, they worked. Nope. Listen, work is a cuss word in church nowadays. Everybody wants the blessing, but nobody wants the blesser. Because to get to the blesser's work, it means you got to pray. It means you got to open your Bible. It means you got to stop letting your wife feed you the scriptures. I'm sorry. I had a little residue for men's fellowship yesterday. I'm so sorry. I told the men yesterday some stuff. Just, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Listen. Sometimes you have to tell your future of your past. The haters were hating. Let them hate. And you just have to tell your future, it's okay. Hey, listen, future, I know you're there. And, and yeah, I know I'm not qualified. I, I, I know I'm a loser. I, I know I'm trash. I I know that I don't have, you know, this amazing name. I don't even have a great family. But let me tell you what I do have. I have the God in my life. The God of heaven in my life. And it's that God of heaven who's going to help me get the success that I need in this life. And so, yeah, you go ahead, future. You try to intimidate. But let me tell you, the God who helped me in my past is the God who's going to help me in my present. And the God who helps me in my present is the God who's going to help me in my future. So future, don't tell me something I already know. 
because grace has brought me here. And I'm going to work with all my heart to see the purpose of God in my life. Got to come to that place. Perfect example as I close here now. Y'all ready to go home and eat? Number three, quickly. God fixes broken stuff if you're not, if you're needed repair. God breaks his broken stuff. God fixes broken stuff. When I think about this, 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 uh, this thought I had, I was thinking, you know what? When my kids, Alexis and, and Isaac, I got both my kids are older now, but I remember when they were kids, and, and, and you know us parents, we're crazy, man, over our kids, right? We just, we just think they're superheroes and everything when they're little, and, you know, they can never make a mistake. But I remember when Alexis and Isaac, when they started, like, walking, man, I remember, man, I'd bust out the big old, man, for some of you, for my time, we had those big VHA, they look like, like TV cameras, they're like, <laughs> oh my God, my and you just chase your child with this big old VHS, you know, that, that was my days. VHS. And, and you'd get all excited, like, oh, my God. And, you'd, and, and you know what? And, and, of course, if, if, if back in those days we had social media, I'd be posting that sucker everywhere, right? But for some of you younger people, you that have little ones right now, how many have little ones right now? And I, okay, wow, good amount of you. Well, check this out. Well, I know what you do. Man, Instagram, Facebook, man, you're putting out there. And you start shouting, oh, my God, my child's walking, my child's walking. But you're lying. No, they're not. You lie. No, your child fell forward. You just recorded the two, three steps, and you're like, yeah, but then you stop recording. You know that's what you did. You lie. My child walked. No, show me when they fell. You see, we always want to put all the good stuff. We always want to show all the glamour stuff. You always want to show off what you're really not. But let me tell you something. Uh, when my kids were growing up, and Alexis is here because I ain't, I ain't lying. Uh, did I not, did I not, when you guys were little, did I not say, okay, you are of the Ruiz family. And I would tell my kids, when they, were, they didn't even talk when I would tell them this. You are of the Ruiz family. You will love God with all your heart. You will love people with all your, I mean, it was like, and they'd be like, hey, you know, like. They didn't know what the heck I was saying. But can you imagine if, if when you're recording your child, you know, falling forward, and, and, and if you were this, this cray-cray parent, and, and you grab your child, and you, and you let's just take Alexis, for example, when she started walking, and I would have lifted her up and be like, girl, you're part of the Ruiz family. You don't fall like this in this house. What is wrong with you? When we walk, we walk. That'd be a cruel parent. And you may be here. That religious person that's saying, that's great, Pastor, but you're talking about children. <laughs> Adults fall too. Yes. Grown men fall too. Grown women fall too. But here's what Proverbs 24 says. Though the righteous may fall seven times, they will rise again. God is raising you back up again. God is bringing you hope again. Amen. Come on, the Lord deserves a greater hand clap than that. This ain't for me. This is for the one that we say, thank you, Father, that when we fall forward, he just picks you back up. He says, go ahead, try that again. And God doesn't delete anything. <laughs> Are you hearing me today? God fixes broken stuff if you're in need of repair. <laughs> but there's a process to that. I'm going to end right there. There's a man in the Bible by the name of uh, Zechariah. And he has a vision of a man named uh, Joshua. And, and Joshua was was described as the high priest and that's how he starts and Joshua the high priest and he, he, he immediately identifies the kind of man he was 
a priest, and he was in his highest place. In other words, I want you to think about the person that you see as the most holiest person, the most righteous person around. Maybe it's your grandmother, maybe it's your mom, your dad. You know, maybe it's someone that you were inspired by, like Mother Teresa, right? Let's just take Mother Teresa. Man, if you think Mother, if people say Mother Teresa, they think, oh my God, this woman was probably, you know, the female version of Jesus. You know, she's just, just so loving, so giving. She, she imitated Paul as, she, as Paul imitated Christ. I mean, the woman was awesome. But here's the interesting thing. So Zechariah sees this vision of Joshua. And Joshua is now in the presence of the Lord. And Satan shows up and he starts his accusation and he says to God, God, look at Joshua. Man, look at that fool. He's a fake, man. He ain't even real. And, and, and God looks at the accusation of the enemy. And I don't know where you come from or what you've done. But God is never going to agree with you. Nor will he agree with the devil. God will only agree with himself. And he looked at Joshua and he said, Josh, take off those filthy clothes. How do you tell a high priest who was living as righteous as possible in his time, who was doing all the right stuff, to take off your filthy clothes? See, the enemy, he had, he had some insight. But so did God. And he said, take off your filthy clothes and 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 the, and and the Lord said to the angel, angel, bring him new garments. Bring him clean garments. See, trash is also filthy, isn't it? And they bring the garments and Zechariah said, also bring him a turban and put it on his head. And, and so now they're dressing, the angel's dressing Joshua. And God tells Satan, did you forget that I pulled that stick out of the fire? <laughs> See, some of us forgot that God pulled you out of the fire. But though he pulled you out of the fire, we all have brokenness. But God says, but when you come to me, when you walk with me, when you live for me, I will clothe you with white garments and cleanse you with the shed blood of my son, Jesus. Bow your head, close your eyes. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.